Hi everybody, today's video is going to be a bit of a rapid fire Q&A. There's a bunch of miscellaneous questions that folks have been asking on some of my videos and none of them warrant a, or I, I couldn't use the full time, uh, or couldn't make a full video out of answering each individual question. So I'm going to answer a bunch of them all at once. Um, just before I jump into that, if you wouldn't mind taking a second just to like or share um, or comment on uh, this post or subscribe uh, to my channel, uh, depending on what you're medium you're watching this on. Um, I'd appreciate it. So thanks in advance for taking a second to do that. So the first question is, um, when is it a bad time to take EDTA, uh, which is a chelating agent uh, for heavy metals, also a biofilm disruptor? Um, someone said uh, not to take it if you have high mercury levels. Is that true? So um, as per usual with uh, my answer to this question and all the questions that are upcoming, uh, nothing I'm saying should be construed as medical advice. This is for informational purposes only. And if you need medical advice, please talk to your healthcare provider to get that advice. So so in terms of a bad time to take EDTA, um, the only way that I recommend EDTA in my practice is intravenously. Uh, my understanding is that EDTA, uh, actually that's not true, um, I recommend it intravenously or um, as a nasal spray. Uh, my understanding is that oral EDTA has very, very poor bioavailability. And so to get that into the bloodstream, to bind up heavy metals throughout the body, or to get a biofilm throughout the body, it's not going to be very effective. Now there are some companies that make liposomal EDTA formulas, which could, w w the idea being which that it's going to be better absorbed um, into the circulatory system. I've never used them, to be honest, um, and I, I don't have any experience with that. So maybe they work, but maybe they don't. I'm just not sure. Um, <clears throat> so when it comes to taking EDTA, again, I'm usually just recommending it as an IV um, or in a nasal spray to treat um, suspected or known uh, biofilms um, in the sinuses. Um, so in terms of like a bad time to take it, um, generally speaking, when it comes to oral chelators or like chelators that one would take, you know, not at an IV visit or whatnot. Um, uh, like, so I recommend oral DMSA as a chelator um, because it's it's one that is absorbed systemically unlike EDTA. Um, I recommend for my patients taking that away from other things, um, largely because DMSA is a really strong binder and it highly prefers to bind to heavy metals. There's a certain kind of descending order of preference um, with which it binds certain metals, you know, lead being um, near the top of that list, you know, mercury being slightly lower than that, and then a bunch of other heavy metals beyond that. But if there's no heavy metals to bind, then the chelator will bind to uh, minerals, which we certainly don't want that to happen. A, because we don't want it to deprive our healthy tissues of those minerals, but also because um, we don't want the DMSA to get all bound up with minerals, like say mixed with our food or in a multivitamin or something like that, and then there's not enough binding sites left over to bind to um, heavy metals in the body, so it'd be kind of a bit useless. So, um, uh, and then in terms of safety of taking EDTA when one has high mercury levels, um, if I had a patient with high mercury levels, um, I mean, the best chelating agent for mercury is called DMPS, um, but um, EDTA is quite good at binding mercury as well. Um, so if somebody had high mercury levels, I would be thinking to myself, I want to treat that patient with a chelator. Um, DMPS would be the preferred um, chelator, but I could use EDTA if we couldn't get DMPS for some reason. Um, now, with that being said, there's a time and a place for chelation in general. So if a patient's body wasn't ready for that chelation, they were really sensitive or their detox pathways weren't being properly supported or this, that, or the other thing, um, timing wise, we wanna make sure it's the right time to do the actual chelation. And that's gonna be a very individualized um, scenario. So thank you for that question. Um, the next question is, um, I or yeah, question after some statements here. Um, I am treating candida uh, with bentonite clay. I took from a pharmacy. Um, it's causing me to have heavy die off, like brain fog and memory problems and making me very tired. Do I know why? Um, so what I've seen in my practice, and I can't comment specifically on this case, but what I've seen in my practice is when folks take binding agents, whether it's bentonite clay, activated charcoal, diatomaceous earth, whatever it happens to be, um, then sometimes we do see die off or sometimes we do see, um, negative symptoms coming up, detoxification symptoms. Sometimes that's because those things can make people constipated. So if their bowels are slowing down as a consequence of that, then that can cause a bunch of side effects to come up. Um, but if their bowels are moving well, that's that wouldn't be it. Um, the main reason that I see these uh, binders causing issues, at least as best as I can tell, is that I feel like it almost sends a signal to the rest of the body saying, hey, we can actually bind up and excrete these toxins um, in, in the intestines more effectively. So let's start dumping more stuff from the cells into the lymphatics and then you know getting that into the bloodstream going to the to the liver to process and I think it kind of sends like almost like a signal to the body saying hey like let's detox more aggressively and if uh, the body's not ready for that then it can cause some some side effects so if I put one of my patients on a binder whether it's clay or something else and they feel worse then 
um, A, I'd be stopping or lowering the dose of the binder for them, but I'd also be thinking like, hmm, do we need to be supporting their detox pathways more effectively? It also can be a clue in my experience that we might be dealing with a mold issue because of all the patients who I've put on binders over the years. Um, it's, um, uh, it's, it's almost been exclusively patients who have a history of mold toxicity uh, where they, they feel worse from those binders when they go on them. I thought I was going to fly through these questions faster. Apparently I'm chatty, so uh, the video is already getting to be a bit too long. So I'm going to leave it there for now. I'll answer the next rapid fire questions um, in the next video. And um, until then, um, I hope you all keep well.